Hello everyone, and welcome to our fifth episode of the third series of real-time painting tutorial videos for painting the miniatures from the A Song of Ice and Fire tabletop game. In this series, we've been painting Ramsey Bolton, Great John Number, and Gregor Clegane, The Mountain That Rides. If you want to follow along with the exact same materials I do, uh, there is a list of those materials in the description, along with Amazon affiliate links. I do earn on any qualifying purchases you make through those links, so it can be a great way to support the channel while also getting some material that you need for yourself. There's also an index down there that'll point you to the various sort of timestamps of when I might be speaking or when something interesting happens in this video. As this video is particularly long, you may want to be referring to that as we go along. This is actually going to be about a half hour uh, single sitting where I sat down and took advantage of having some black ink thinned out as you can see with the Vallejo Flow Improver on my palette and touched up pretty much everywhere that I wanted to be grey or black on the miniatures. We're going to use this for character's hair, the cowl on Ramsey's cloak, and the entirety of the Great John's cloak underneath the bear skin there. And then we're also going to be doing up the uh, mountain that rides big old horse. And then we're finally going to mix together our thinned black ink with some silver acrylic ink, making a sort of base that I like to put underneath where I intend to place metal color later. So we're going to be using that for all the portions of armor, weapons, chainmail, that kind of stuff. Altogether, this is a pretty uh, hefty episode, um, so I do recommend you jump around a little bit, take a look at the parts that interest you most, or that you may be working on at home, uh, if you want to see how I mixed my paints, or what I was working on at a particular point in time. Before we go in further, I just want to mention we're using highly thinned ink here, so that's black ink with the flow improver, and that means that it's going to be very, very runny, particularly because the flow improver is going to destroy the surface tension of that ink and just make it flow much better, as the name suggests. What that means is you're going to have to work uh, fairly hard to keep this under control and make sure it doesn't flow away into areas you don't want it. Uh, a good way to do this is just limiting the amount that's charged on your brush. If you take the brush and you sort of roll it out to the side after you've charged it within your uh, liquid on the palette, what you'll do is twofold. You'll actually uh, help it keep a point by rolling it into a point shape. And you'll also wring out a little bit of the excess paint and take off any sort of droplets that may have gathered at the tip of the brush that are going to just flood out your miniature. I try to do this uh, on occasion just to keep things uh, under control on the paintbrush and make sure that my ink isn't going to run away and just get everywhere on me. For this part, it's fairly simple. I'm using a reasonably fine-tipped brush, although not overly fine-tipped. Um, and I'm just touching up all of the areas that I think should be black. You'll see I'm also adjusting the viscosity and the thinness of my black ink as we go along. Uh, this is for two reasons, once again. The first reason is obviously I might want different saturations of black on different areas. For example, on Gregor's horse, I actually want it to look quite black. But uh, I'm using the flow improver to make sure that the pale areas do flow to a much lighter gray. Um, and the second reason that I'm adjusting the uh, amount of flow improver as we go along is that the flow improver actually sets up to a sort of jelly texture. Um, after about eight minutes, uh, maybe a little bit more. So you do want to be kind of refreshing that, stirring it up again, and making sure that the consistency of your ink is actually the runny consistency that we're looking for by adding flow improver to ink and not this sort of jelly not very spreadable texture because once it gets to that jelly stage you're going to start leaving streaks on your miniature which obviously we don't want um, we want a smooth surface that's why we're using flow improver anyway that's that for now i'm just going to carry on painting the black areas and uh, i'll be back uh, later
now that I've gotten good coverage over the horse, I'm going to use a little bit of extra flow improver here and uh, thin out this black ink even more so that I can use it to shade Gregor's cloak. Now we've just gone to the effort of throwing some light gray onto it to sort of even out the color from just the raw primer. Uh, and now we want to pull down the shadowed areas and make it look a little dirtier and uh, more rustic as it were. So we're firing on this flow, flow improver thinned black ink um, reasonably thickly. Um, when you're applying washes like this, you do kind of want to trust the wash as far as it goes and let it pool in and really don't um, don't underdo it, I guess. Because if you underdo it, you're going to start seeing the actual lines between where you put ink on and where you didn't. Um, you do want to have full coverage everywhere. And then after that, using a clean brush or even the same brush you applied it with, although that can leave some streaks, uh, you can nurse it around into the positions you want it to if you see it's flowing places you don't want it to collect. Doing the Great John's Cloak here, you can see I sort of considered what I was going to do for a little while. There's a lot of other colored areas nearby, and the bear skin in particular has a very distinct texture at the bottom of it. That sort of spiky, furry thing we've got going on. Uh, we don't want to ruin that, so you do want to be fairly careful, again, with the consistency of your ink as you go over this area. So it's not just spilling over and flowing everywhere, and you can push it into the areas you actually want it to be in. Um, at this point, actually, that slightly jellified texture that I'd mentioned earlier of the flow improver that's been sitting there for a little while kind of helped. Um, it's still going to flow, even though it feels a little more solid, but it also, uh, well, it's a little more solid. So you can press it into positions that are a little tricky like that, um, perhaps a little bit easier than you would if it was straight up still just, you know, flowing as it did right after pouring. Um, Take some care while applying the ink over this area because it's a fairly small area, but it is also a fairly small area. So if you have any issues, uh, use a clean paintbrush. You can kind of wick away any messes that you make. Uh, and if you do get a little bit over the edge, this is a highly thin black ink mixture. So it kind of just passes for shadow. Um, it may stand out if you're looking real close, but uh, definitely use your judgment. Try to wipe it away as best you can. 
At this point, we're going to be moving into that mixture of black ink and silver that I discussed. Um, what this does is it lays down a base that uh, after we varnish our miniatures, uh, because we'll be using a matte varnish, which will, which will take the shine off of most silvers. Um, once we've varnished our miniature, we are then going to have these areas that are slightly gray, um, slightly black, uh, very good uh, sort of a facsimile for shadowed metal. Um, and then later on, when uh, the varnish is set, we're going to be dry brushing silver over top in order to give a metallic feel to those metallic areas. If we were just doing it over the gray here with a dry brushing technique, we'd have gray showing through and it would look kind of so-so, but by putting on this silverish black underneath, it means that the dry brush catches the raised edges, makes them shine a little bit, and the recesses in the metallic areas remain a slightly metallic black color. As I mentioned previously, the um, sort of skirts on the Great John's uh, armor thing here are supposed to be some sort of lamellar armor according to the concept art so we're just going to cover those up. Um, I'm going to leave the brown ink on the edges because that makes a nice outline like some leather folded over to cover up the lacing or something um, but all of the actual little plates we're going to cover up. And now we're just going to go around all of the miniatures and apply this to all the metallic areas. As you do so just keep in mind this is probably the thickest and most covering paint that we have in the entire process for making these miniatures. Um, metallic paints to begin with are very, very difficult to clean off of areas if you get them in the wrong place. Uh, and in this case, it's a very dark mixture as well, so it will stain anything you get it on that isn't your intentional area. Most of this painting is pretty loosey-goosey, but this part you, you do want to take some care with because the stains are going to be pretty obvious. You can blend them in or you can cover them up afterwards, but you won't be able to just wick away this paint as easily or as effectively as you would other paints. I'll put a timestamp in the index for every single one of the characters as we go over them so that you can follow along with the specific character you want to watch being painted, or you can go through all of them. Uh, since this will be the majority of the remainder of the episode.
All right, we're coming up on the end here. Uh, you'll see the pauldrons and helmets still need done. We're going to be getting to that later because I had to take a break for this little marathon of painting. Um, it's a lot to be staring at and trying to be very, very precise with so you avoid getting this like thick black silver mixture onto areas that shouldn't be black silver um, to begin with, especially on like Gregor Clegane with his yellow, um, just the most stainable color in existence. Um, I really like this step when it comes to actually painting because then you start to really see the color schemes come together. You start to see the miniatures um, filled out a little bit. Um, all those gray areas that are going to be metal. You know, metal is such a big part of these fantasy miniatures for their armor, their weapons, whatever. Um, having them finally colored in and not just showing us primer does a lot for you to look at your miniature and go, Oh man, this is finally turning into something great. Anyway. I hope you enjoyed watching this, and I hope you might have learned something. If you've got any questions, comments, or suggestions, throw them down in the comment section. I'd love to see them, or see me on Facebook or Instagram. Um, and with that, thanks for watching, and go play some games.